morning to everyone who's here, especially if you are visiting with us as a first or second time guest. We're glad that you're here. I typically preach on Sunday morning, and you have come in the middle, kind of towards the latter end of a series that we are calling Jesus Is. So we've been talking a lot about if Jesus has resurrected from the dead, which we believe he has, then the things written about him in the Bible are true, which they are. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about some of these aspects of Jesus. And today, we're going to be focusing on the fact that Jesus is humble. You know, whenever you read the Bible, right, especially the New Testament, it's filled with a bunch of stories about what Jesus said and did. And some may take that as bragging. Some may take that as somebody saying, oh, look at how wonderful Jesus is. And it may come across as proud. Or even the apostles and the letters, the works and the teachings that they did, it may almost sound as if they were bragging, but they weren't. It was about this guy named Jesus and his followers who were some of the most humble men that you could ever meet in your entire life. You see, the difference between being a proud person and a humble person is about the attitude of the heart, not in the actions that you perform. One of the guys that comes to my mind when I think about somebody who was not at all is Muhammad Ali. Any Muhammad Ali fans in here, right? Yeah, Muhammad Ali, I grew up uh, watching some of the highlight reels, and I remember watching a few videos about him, but I'm just not that old to be able to watch him live. Some of you are. <clears throat> Won't call you out by name, you know what I'm saying? But anyways, so Muhammad Ali was like the least humble person you could ever meet in your entire life. He's known for saying, I am the greatest. Right? I am the greatest. He's not, he's not what you would want to replicate as a humble person. There's, a, there's a, a movie that was out, Ron Burgundy, and, and Ron Burgundy's like this news anchor, and he said, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> and if you're thinking that's something that Rick would say, that's not true. I would never say that about myself. There's a t-shirt that, uh, that I saw online. It basically said, you know, I'm awesome, or it's not that really I'm that great, I'm just better than you, is what it said. It's not that I'm that great, I'm just better than you. I mean, being a proud person is something that has really saturated our society, because we live in the United States of America, and it's all about us. How can the government benefit us? What's in it for me? How can I get the best deal? Who's going to respect my time, my wants, my wishes, my desires? I mean, it is Captain Me universe, right? especially in this D.C. area. It seems like people today are so saturated with themselves that they've missed the heart of the gospel, of what it means to be a humble person. If I could define humility for you, I would say it's this, lowliness in mind. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It means to put others before yourself. And it's not merely this outward uh, demeanor, these actions that we have, but it's an intention, it's an attitude of the heart. It, it, it flows from who we are and what we think about ourselves. And so this morning, I would like for you to turn, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 19, but the bulk of our passage is going to be in Matthew chapter 20, and we are going to look at a description of what Jesus says, if you are going to be the greatest, what is it going to take? If you want to be lifted up and be exalted, what is it going to take? You see, there's nothing wrong with being great. The problem is, is when we go about greatness in the wrong way. The Bible says, verse 5, Everyone who is proud in his heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished. And we find this true even in the New Testament, right? We find something like pride comes before the fall. We find warnings of being a proud person. It is in the essence of pride that Satan fell because he tried to be that which he was not. He tried to gain something that he could never get because he viewed himself higher than what he should. The Bible also commands Christians that this is something that you have to do, right? Put on, put on this jacket, put on those clothes, put that t-shirt on. Something that you willfully choose to do and practice. These four things difficult. It is not easy to put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Man, that's tough. Everything in your life is saying, be self-centered. Think about yourself. What's going to happen if the next financial disaster comes about? You got to make sure you take care of you. What's going to happen with your time, with your health, What's going to happen with you? And every decision that you make needs to be centered around you. Who cares about the people around you? And so we can become utterly selfish in our pursuit of being great. 
The passage this morning has a little bit of background. Basically, Jesus had come on the scene, and the Jews had this certain messianic expectation of what the Messiah would bring. Their idea of the Messiah was somebody who would bring power and majesty and wealth and prestige and prominence. In other words, they thought that the kingdom of God was going to be a material kingdom where they were going to get gold crowns and jewels, and they were going to control the entire world. They thought the Messiah was going to come on a white stallion, and finally, once he came, we could put those Romans, those Greeks, those Babylonians, those Persians, anybody who's ever stepped on the Jews is finally going to pay because now we're going to be in charge. That's what they thought about the kingdom. And so the Messiah comes on the scene, And he's got power, but he's a carpenter. He's got wealth, but it's not material wealth. It's it's heavenly wealth. The nature of the kingdom was totally different than what they expected it to be. Incredibly different. And so Jesus told them this. He said, even though the nature of the kingdom is going to be a little bit different than what you expected it to be, nevertheless, you are going to reign with me. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Look at what he told them. He says, truly I say unto you, speaking to his disciples, that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall sit upon the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Listen, disciples, you fishermen, you nobodies who have called you to follow me, you're not even going to judge the world, but you're even going to judge your fellow brethren, the twelve tribes of Israel. And so in their mind, they're pairing these biblical truths with these false expectations, and it's going to produce an unnatural result that we're going to find in Matthew chapter 20. You know, this week I was thinking about this. Are there things in my life and in my mind as a Christian that even though the idea is founded on biblical principles, have I been misguided in any way? There have been certainly things and times in my life when I have felt misguided, like becoming a Christian meant everything was going to go perfectly and you were never going to have sin or suffering and that you're just going to be this awesome person. Anybody ever felt like that before, right, before you became a Christian? Or like once I got baptized, right, I'd feel this like jolt of the Holy Spirit and I would never sin again. I thought about that as a Christian. Some people believe that becoming a Christian means you're going to be healthy and wealthy and wise and it's going to be nothing but peaches and cream and life's never going to be tough. These are are false expectations grounded in what we would consider to be somewhat a biblical truth. But man, all it takes is just a little twisting and a little a a little twisting and turning of what God actually meant for us, and then we can become confused. And so this morning, when it comes to the nature of the kingdom and the type of life that God wants us to live, I want us to look to Jesus and the words that he had to say about how to become the greatest. Look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. It says, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, and bowing down, she wanted to make a great request of him. You see, Jesus had been promising these powerful truths to his disciples, but he also told them this. Just in the previous chapter, he had told them, I'm going to die. I am going to die. For the Messiah to die and come back to life again was an unheard of teaching in their minds for that day. No way. Absolutely not. The Messiah cannot die. He is here to establish God's kingdom. And so Jesus drops this bombshell on them. And this really shows the great faith of the disciples. Because in spite of what the religious elite and what they taught during that time, they were still willing to follow a Messiah who would be willing to die and come back to life. That took a lot of guts. That took a lot of faith and a lot of trust in this guy named Jesus. So in one sense, I don't want you to think that these disciples are just completely ridiculous. How dare they act this way that we're getting ready to see? These guys had great faith. But at the same time, remember, biblical principles mixed with false expectations produces an unnatural result that God expects for our life. And so here's this woman, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. This is James and John. They were also called sons of thunder. They got really frustrated with this city that was totally rejecting the gospel. And so they asked Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven? In other words, should we just burn them all up? And Jesus is like, how about a negative on that one, okay? (laughs) That's not your place. And so these guys are really fired up. They're really passionate about following Jesus. But they couldn't help but wanting a little bit more. They couldn't help but wanting to be great. And so what better way to play on the heartstrings of Jesus than to send your mom to do the dirty work for you? Hey, mom, will you just take care of this? You are grown adults. Go ask him yourself, right? That's what I would have been thinking. But here's the deal. So this mother, um, she was actually the sister of Jesus's mom. And so it's not just some random woman in the community. This is Jesus's aunt. 
Think about that for a moment. James and John are Jesus' cousins, and Jesus calls these guys to follow him as his disciples. And at this time, it's expected that their father has passed away. And so this background had a lot of them trying to manipulate the situation to pull on the heartstrings of Jesus to get something that they wanted. And so they send mom, who doesn't have a husband, who's probably wanting to invoke some type of sympathy or Old Testament kinsman idea in Jesus' heart. And she asked Jesus a very important request. She is way overly ambitious. And look at what happens here in verse 21. It says, And he said unto her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left. Now, if you actually go to the parallel account in Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10 omits the mom at all. And often this is a simple explanation. If you commission someone on your behalf, it was just as good as if you had went. And so Mark deals in the context of the passage as if the mom wasn't even there, and it was just James and John asking them. But Matthew gives us a little bit more background to the story. He tells us that it wasn't just James and John asking, that they actually sent their mom, the aunt of Jesus, to ask on their behalf. And we know that this is true because even in the context of the rest of this chapter of Matthew, Jesus speaks to James and John as as if the mom hadn't even made the request. So it's really no big deal. There's no contradiction here. But hopefully this gives us a little bit of background to the attitude and the heart of James and John. And look at the audacity. Look at what they're asking for here. We want the seats of honor. If you could picture this throne room like this, the back wall, you had the, you had the chair right here, and then there would be six seats on each side, and they would slowly curve in a semicircle, and the seats of honor, one would be on the left, and one would be on the right. And this was the same truth of a meal that they would have. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about when you would eat in the Old Testament times, they would have a U-shaped table, and on the left-hand side, you would have um, the seats of honor right here and right here, and the second person on the end would actually be the honorable guest. And so the seats of honor would be next to him. And so they come up, and they're asking Jesus, Jesus, in your kingdom, we want to be number one and number two. Think about that for a moment. That's arrogant, if you ask me. And it's arrogant if you ask Jesus. But they want what they want. Have you ever felt like that, right? You're a pretty good person, but man, when it comes to something that you want, you'll manipulate and twist and invoke some type of absolute need, like I absolutely have to have this Mustang. If I don't, I won't be able to live without it, husbands or wives. If I don't have $2,000 a month in clothing expenses, I won't be able to exist. I have to have this for my professional career, you know what I'm saying? Or kids, when they try to get their parents and twist their arm into getting toys, everybody has it, and I'll be such a loser if I don't have something like this. I mean, let's be honest. We all, at one point in time, manipulate other people around us to get what we want. If you don't think that you do that, you have a very loud wake-up call coming to your own mind, okay? Because we all do it. And the faster that you're aware of it, the better off you'll be. And so that's exactly what these guys do. They want to be beside Jesus. And here's what's really funny. In Mark chapter 10, verse 35, like I said, Mark 10 is the parallel account. They actually approach Jesus, and here's what it says. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you before they even ask the question. (laughs) It's like a kid coming up to their parents and saying, now don't say no, okay? But I'm going to ask you a question. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Or, Or maybe you've done something that, you know, some work or something, you're like, okay, before I show you, you can't laugh. It's these type of childish conditions that they're trying to place on Jesus. Jesus? You have to say yes before we ask you. You think Jesus is going to fall for something like that? Absolutely not. And hopefully we won't either. So they approach Jesus and they really want Jesus to say yes. And there's already been this underworking of pride and vying for power in the kingdom. They've already been trying to do it this whole time. They want to be number one. They want to be the most important. In fact, at one specific time in Matthew chapter 18, the disciples are around and they say, Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Look up on the screen with me and see what Jesus' response was. Verse 2, he called a child to himself and he set him before them and said, Truly I say unto you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a pretty bold statement. In other words, unless you're willing to be humble, you can't even get access into God's kingdom, let alone be the greatest. And so there's this underworking of 
vying for power and who's the greatest in the kingdom and Jesus has been teaching them all along, your false expectations have got to go. Unless you're willing to be humble, unless you're willing to serve, unless you're willing to do, you cannot even enter the kingdom of God, let alone be the greatest. He's not going to give in to their petty questions, to their manipulation. And so he asked the mother, what do you wish? And she says, command. Let's just settle this right now. The disciples have been arguing amongst themselves who's the greatest. Let's get this out of the way right now. Jesus, command. My two sons are going to be the greatest in the kingdom. You see, James and John want the seats of honor next to Jesus, but they're asking out of ignorance. And as we'll see in this passage, they have no clue what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. And by asking to be the greatest, they're actually going to become the least. You see, it's often out of ignorance that we seek leadership and power and glory, and the brothers don't know what they're asking. And even if you think of it in this life, you wanted that promotion so bad at your job, and when you finally got it, you look back and said, I immediately regret this decision, right? It is not what you expected. Or you finally were able to get in a relationship with the person you always wanted, and you got that status, and you got that profile, and you get in a relationship with them, and you're thinking, wow, this was a big mistake. I had no idea what I was signing up for, right? Right? And we do this often. We overcommit ourselves because we're really sometimes ignorant of what it is that we're signing up for. And we want money and power and wealth and success. And then when we finally get it, we are wrecked because we didn't expect what would come along with it. And that's exactly what's happening in this passage. Matthew Henry said this, We know not what we ask when we ask for glory of wearing the crown and ask not for grace to bear the cross and our way to it. Little did they know that they were asking for a cross. And so they're ignorant of what they're asking, and they're blind by their own arrogant ambition, actually thinking that they could not only sit on the right and the left of Jesus, but they could outperform the disciples, and Jesus would fall for it because he was their relative, because they had position. In other words, they had the right kind of connections, and so Jesus would give it to them absolute manipulation, and they thought that Jesus would do this. You see, by asking for this position, by asking to be number one and number two, based off of manipulation and their relationship with Jesus, they were looking at the other apostles and they were saying, it's not about the kind of work that you do or the quality of person that you are. It's about who you know and how you're connected. And I can't stand that right? I can't stand when people get things based off of who they're connected with. It's about who's the best person for the job. I don't care if you're black or white or Asian. It doesn't matter. Who is the best person for the job? I don't care if you're wealthy or poor. Those things do not matter, and they don't matter to Jesus. And so Jesus has to give them a stern rebuke, and we find this often in the scriptures. For instance, Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says this, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. We cannot go through this life and expect greatness in the kingdom of God if we aren't willing to consider other people more important than ourselves. If we can't get rid of this idea and this mindset that it's about who you know and how you're connected, we cannot be great in the kingdom of God. It is not about family or reputation or prestige or color or money to Jesus. It's about your heart and your attitude and your mind. So we are to consider others above ourselves. So when we have, for instance, church church fellowship meals and we fellowship in the back, who's the most important? Everyone else. When we have Sunday morning service, who should have the best seats? Others. When we drive to the church to park, who should get the front spots? Other people. When we operate as a church and we consider the needs and how we should minister, we should consider everyone else before we're willing to say, hey, what about me? My needs aren't getting met. It is up to me. I want to decide. It is all about me. And that's exactly where we find James and John. If you want to do great things for the kingdom of God, if you want to be great in the kingdom, look at what Jesus says in Luke chapter 14. He says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And he also went on to say that the one who has invited him, so they invited Jesus to this dinner, he says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Otherwise, they also might invite you in return, and that you will, and that will be your repayment. In other words, Don't invite the people who are able to pay you back. 
if you want to be great. Look what he says. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, go after the ones that nobody wants. Touch the untouchables. Love the unlovables. Seek out the poor and those who are physically broken and can't take care of themselves. If you really want greatness, you have to go after the least. It's a little bit like this. When I think about how God views my service and our service as a church, I like to go out to eat just like everybody else, right? Obviously. And when I go out to eat, there are some, I always start off 20%. It takes a whole lot to work me down from 20%, okay? I mean, you really have to stink. But when we go out to eat, what do you want? You want the waitress or waiter to be pleasant, nice individual. You'd like to have your food in a reasonable amount of time and it to be warm. Even if it's not that great. Look, I'm the one who ordered it. I'm the one who chose the food. It's not the waitress or waiter's fault, right? You guys with me? Uh, it could be the cook's fault, and then I'll go talk to him, but not them, right? So there are certain things that, that we want. But man, when they're slow... And nobody's even, you're sitting at the table for 10 minutes and nobody's there. And then finally you get to order and it's 30 minutes later and the food comes out and it's cold. And you're like, man, this stinks. This service is terrible. Why? Because it's not what I ordered. Same way it is with God. When he looks at our service, does it stink? Is it what God ordered? When you look at the word of God and you read the Bible and God says, I want you to go after the poor and the needy and the weak, not the wealthy and your friends and those who can pay you back. When the Bible says, I want you to be humble and gentle and compassionate and kind and gracious to one another. Are you what God ordered or does your service stink? Jesus says, we're going to be repaid back at the resurrection. And look at Jesus' response here. He says to them in Matthew chapter 20, verse 22, he says, you don't know what you're asking for. You have no idea what you're signing up for. They had this popular notion that the kingdom would start in Jerusalem and they would rule the world. And Jesus says, you've completely misunderstood what it means to follow me and what kind of crown I'm going to bear and what it means to be in the kingdom of God. James and John are asking for places of honor from a king who would shortly be executed on a cross and his skull ingrained with a crown of thorns with two thieves killed on his right and on his left. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's what it means to be great. And I wonder how often we do the exact same thing. How often do we seek to promote our wants and our desires in the kingdom, thinking that our wants and our desires are what's best for the kingdom of God? James and John thought it was their family influence, solicitation, and favor that could be necessary, kingdom, necessary conditions to be great in the kingdom, and that's absolutely false. God looks at the person, and it's their fitness and their quality that decides the greatness. It's who they are, not only on the inside, but how their inside carries out. You see, when family influence and money and power and social status and business success become factors for places of honor in God's kingdom, we have got a big problem. We have misunderstood the nature of the kingdom of God. And look at the question that Jesus asked him here in this passage. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And look at the response. It just goes to show that despite them being willing to follow Jesus, right, knowing he was going to die, but still looking forward to this wonderful kingdom they were going to inherit, man, did they not realize exactly what that meant. And look at what their response is. We are able. The cup immediately would have brought to mind, anytime you look up the word cup, it typically was used in the sense of God's wrath in the Old Testament. God pouring out his cup of undiluted wine. You were a madman in the Old Testament if you drank wine undiluted. That's what they believed, right? Because it would intoxicate you like that. And so this idea, this picture of God's wrath in the Old Testament of this cup of wine that is totally undiluted, it is unmixed. I mean, it is full throttle wrath. And Jesus says, this is the cup that I'm going to drink. I'm going to drink God's wrath. Are you able to drink it? Are you able to bear it? And they said, Yep. <laughs> wow. Had they totally misunderstood the nature of the kingdom and who God was. Oh, man. I just, it, it made me laugh when I read it this week. Mark records actually this. Mark adds to Jesus' words, Are you able to be baptized with the baptism by which I am baptized? The word baptizo in the Greek meant total immersion. It never meant sprinkle or pour. It was always total immersion. And so Mark uses baptizo in a, in a metaphorical sense, which means completely encompassing. Totally, absolutely immersed in the wrath of God. 
And they said, yeah, Jesus, we can take it. They overestimated their abilities, okay? (laughs) They really did. Have you ever done that? Have you ever overestimated your abilities? I do it all the time, right? I typically will overcommit and I'll sign up because I do really want to help people, but I'll sign up and I got to know my limitations. You know what I'm saying? Like, for instance, I shared this story with you, Ken Moore, right? He has his own shop, mechanic. I mean, he put me right back in line when I tried to overcommit. Hey, Ken, can I, can I offer to help you is what I said. And he goes, man, that is a scary thought. <laughs> I do, I, don't let me work on your car, okay? If I'm like, yeah, man, we'll do, we'll take care of it. We'll look at YouTube. Just say, look, Rick, thank you, but no thank you. All right, I got to know my limitations. When I was a kid, there are so many times as a child, right, you really don't know your limitations. You kind of push yourself beyond what you should be able to bear. And man, as, as the youngest kind of in my family uh, with cousins and stuff, I always wanted to be around the, the older kids, right? It's a natural thing as a kid. And so sometimes you kind of overcommit and you expect too much of yourself. And so here we are at the park, and I was the youngest, like I said, out of all the cousins. And then I was with the oldest and my sister. His name was Ryan. My sister's name was Abby. And we decided to go as a family to, it was the Muskingum County Fair, okay? So it wasn't anything big and glamorous. They had this one ride called the Zipper. I wanted to hang out with my cousin Ryan, right? I'm a pretty cool guy. I can take it. And so I had never really ridden a ride like that before. And you see it, and it's like a zipper. It just goes up and around. But here's the catch. As it goes up and around like this, each little mini cart will spin in circles. And often you can determine the velocity of that spin by your body movement. And so some of them are kind of spinning slow. And then you got these psychopaths who just don't care about their life who want to spend it fast. Little did I know I was with a couple psychopaths. (laughs) <laughs> and so we get in this car. I will never forget this for the rest of my life because it horrified me. So we get in this car, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, re- I'm like really nervous. So how do I solve this issue? Just going to close my eyes the whole time. Problem solved. I'm awesome, right? <laughs> so we get in this car. Ryan's on my left. Abby's on my right. I'm the most important one in the middle. Naturally, I pick that position because that's the safest. And so we get up, and, you know, everyone's getting loaded, and it's going around, and all of a sudden, they start rocking it. And I'm like, wait a second. Literally. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You know that panic when you're out of control and so you think just screaming will help? And so I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Stop, stop, stop. And they are laughing their heads off because they know I am starting to panic. And then the ride starts to go. And at that moment, I could care less what anybody thought of me. I screamed at the top of my lungs, get me out of here! Help! Help! especially when we went down by the, by the mechanic who was running it, I screamed as loud as we could, and they were laughing so hard. I mean, they laughed so hard, they almost peed themselves. That's how hard they were laughing. And I didn't care. I was screaming at the top of my lungs, I'm going to die! I'm going to die! Get me out of here! Overestimated my ability to ride the zipper, okay? Finally, I screamed loud enough. They actually stopped the whole thing and let me, get, let me get off, and I'm like, I'm cool, no big deal. So humiliated, absolutely ridiculous. And finally, when my cousins got off the ride, they said, Rick, you're a 20-year-old guy. You should be able to take something like this. Absolutely ridiculous. So all in all, you know, it was a successful trip. The point is this. Their inability to see the king as one who would sacrifice for others revealed their inability to see the proper role as a servant. They could not see themselves as the role of a servant. They wanted power. They wanted prestige because they misunderstood the nature of the kingdom. And the path to promotion in the kingdom of God is a path of sacrifice and service and solitude, but most importantly, humility. Look at what Jesus says, verse 23. My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. They said, we can take it. We can do it. Put us on the zipper. Let's go. And Jesus said, oh, you're, you're going to drink my cup. And you're going to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. And little did they know that James would be one of the first martyrs in the kingdom. In Acts chapter 12, he was killed for Jesus. His brother John went on to write the book of Revelation, was persecuted, thrown in jail, beaten, stripped naked. And ultimately, he died on an, all, on an island we call Patmos in his ripe old age for Jesus. They drank the cup of God's wrath. And so Jesus hands them a blank check of suffering, and this was a promise to all the disciples. Here's how Paul put it. Do you want a path to glory? Do you want a path to greatness in the kingdom? Look at what Paul says in Colossians 1.24. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, 
And in my flesh, I share on behalf of his body, being Jesus, which is the church, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Can you imagine being at the mature point in your life, the great point in your life where you can say, thank you, Jesus, for the sufferings that I'm going through. Paul was going to die. He was going to be beheaded. He had been stoned, and he actually did die. His body went up to the third heaven. He actually, but he came back to life. Paul was crucified, metaphorically, for Jesus. And he said, thank you, God, for this. Luke chapter 14, verse 11 says, Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so if you want to see things change in the church, in your families, at your jobs, in your schools, or within yourself, the greatest thing that you can do is to serve other people, to lay your life on the line for Jesus. We like to take recommendations at the church. The elders love to hear your voice, but they also want to serve alongside you. Think about a husband and a wife there are things that you want your spouse to do, what better way to reach their heart than to lay your life down in love and service to them? Parents, do you want your kids to follow Jesus? What better way than to serve alongside them? Don't just sign them up to serve. Be there with them. Be alongside them. The second thing that you can do, not only serve, but remove jealousy from your heart and absolutely refuse to thoughtlessly and arrogantly criticize other people. You see, it was in this moment, that's exactly what they did. They said, Jesus, we want to be the greatest because we view ourselves as the greatest. They looked at the apostles, the other disciples, and it was a judgment upon them. Our prestige and our position is more important than what you do. And look at what happens here. Verse 24 tells us, and hearing this, the other ten became indignant with the two brothers. They were really upset. How dare they try to outmaneuver us and get the very thing that we deserve? Let me just end with this story. The rest of the passage goes on like this. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, it says, but Jesus called them to himself and said, so here they are fighting. And they're like, how dare you try to outmaneuver us? And they were probably upset at themselves because they weren't as smart as James and John. And so Jesus is like, guys, stop arguing about this worthless greatest in the kingdom stuff that you've totally misunderstood. Come over here. Let me teach you something. And here's what he says. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Not just your doulos, not just your servant. Now this word deacon is where we get our word deacon. We have really lost touch with the reality of this word. We think of a minister, you know, somebody like myself. But a deacon in those times, it was just a natural Greek title for anybody that would come take care of your lawn, clean your house, do like just like what could be considered menial stuff, not really great stuff, like sit on a throne. And so these are people who are willing to come pick up your trash. And Jesus says, if you're not willing to pick up trash, you can't be great. Even more so, if you're not willing to become a slave. Slavery, none of us own slaves. We really don't know what it feels like to be a slave. Yeah, we can look at history and see what they've done, but man, what it would have felt like in that moment for Jesus to say, you've got to become somebody who's willing to sell yourself and to the ownership of another person, to do the unspeakable things. This word slave comes from the idea of like an under rower, somebody who would sit the third level down on a ship in total darkness and in chains and do nothing for the rest of his life but row. That's what it meant to be a servant of Jesus. And Jesus says, if you want to be great, you got to become like that. It would have revolutionized their idea about greatness. And I hope it does the same thing for you this morning. He focuses on two things. He says, first of all, the Gentiles, they got a power structure issue. It's a pyramid of power. It's about their position. Just because you're in a position, you can decide what goes. Jesus says, that's not how my kingdom works. It's not about the person who sits at the top of the triangle. What Jesus did, he took that pyramid and he turned it upside down and he says it's about the person at the bottom, the one who's going to serve everybody. So it's not about your position. And he also says it's not about your personality. He says the the great men, they exercise authority. You know, some people just have a certain charisma about them. They can speak in such a way. They just almost demand people to follow them based on their personality and their influence. Jesus says, in my kingdom, it's not like that. It's not about the people who have the personality or the position. It's about the people who are willing to serve. 
He says, not so with you. And so greatness among Jesus' disciples is based on service, not on position and power and influence. And then as if that wasn't enough, Jesus says this in verse 28, the most powerful part, and probably one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture in all the New Testament. Jesus uses himself as an example. Look what he says in verse 28. He says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served. The King of the universe, the creator of the world who came and was born amongst men, who took on flesh. He says, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Back in the Old Testament days, they had this idea where if you were enslaved and you were caught by another army, the only way that you could break free from your slavery was for your family to come and pay a price. They could exchange themselves or they could exchange money for you. And Jesus says, I have come to this world not to get gold, not to get palaces, not to gather all of these wonderful things of position and power and influence. I have not come to be served, but I have come not just to serve, but to give my life in exchange for yours. 